I'm reading this morning from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 6th chapter, verse 25 through 33. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat and what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And can any of you, by worrying, at a single hour of your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of the things. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Our A couple of summers back, my wife, some friends of ours, and myself attended a show out at Connor Prairie's Symphony on the Prairie. The particular show that I'm referring to was with Garrison Keeler. He's the host of the long-running radio program, A Prairie Home Companion. Anybody familiar with Prairie Home Companion with Garrison? Garrison Keeler has a unique way of interacting with the crowd. And that evening, he really had an interesting way of interacting with the crowd. Nice stage at Symphony on the Prairie, but he took the microphone, it was a portable microphone, and he started wandering through the crowd. And if you've been there for Symphony on the Prairie, you're sitting in your lawn chairs, or maybe you have a little table set up, and he's just wandering through there telling stories and singing songs. And so we really became aware of this technique when he was singing the love song. And he approached the area where we were sitting, and it seemed like he was making direct eye contact with people in our group. Plus, from my viewpoint, he was actually making the song up as he went. Huh? I'm not sure that it was a song that I'd ever heard, but he was like doing things. He'd walk by a lady in a plaid dress, and somehow he would tie that into the song. You know? Or he would go by a blonde or redhead, and somehow, all of a sudden, there was a blonde and redhead in the song. So it seemed like he was making it up as he went by, and, and uh, it was pretty amazing, I thought. My conclusion was, after being there and entertained by Garrison Keillor, I, I love his program anyhow, is that he uses his surroundings to illustrate stories and songs. He uses surroundings to illustrate stories and songs. Jesus also had a unique way of teaching, and he as well used his surroundings to illustrate his point. Now, he could bring those who were there listening to him to be taught into a better way of listening to him by the way he did things. If you note this morning in this passage we read today, kind of use your imagination a little bit, and you've got to think it must be springtime in Galilee. The reason I say that is because of what he starts talking about. Again, he kind of wanders through the crowd. He doesn't have a podium. There aren't pews for people to sit in or chairs. So he's walking around the crowd, listening to them, and they're listening to him. He's making eye contact with those people as he walks through the crowd talking to them. And he would use simple things that were local to them that they could see to illustrate things. Now I say it was springtime because, you know, the grass is green and the wildfires booming because he's, he's using these things as, as points of, of things. Probably not the color of carpet in the fields that we're used to because in in the Galilee, the flowers would have been different, but nonetheless, there would have been things like red poppies that were stunning and regal and, and, and beautiful to look at, and the landscape would have been utterly fantastic to see. 
as he sees these flyers, they stand out, he decides he's going to use those as an illustration for what it is he's talking about. And beyond the flowers, he probably heard birds singing and flying overhead. And it kind of provided food for thought for him to use as illustrations. And so Jesus, as he walks around the crowd delivering this sermon, he sees that and knows that people are worrying about a lot of things. And so he uses these illustrations to help people understand you don't need to worry. You know, we worry about things in our lives that we cannot see. And yet faith, according to St. Augustine, quote, is believing what you cannot see. And the reward of faith is seeing what you have believed. I think worry is the optimum word here. Worry and anxiety are synonymous. And anxiety is perhaps a curse in our century that we live right now. We worry about things that we can't control. And sometimes we worry about things that we're unable to control. Hmm? Many times we just worry for the sake of worry. This past week was one of those tough weeks in, in my family, it seemed like. My son's home was burglarized. Not only his home, but four or five other homes on his block were broken into that day. And, you know, some of the people had their houses locked and had alarm systems. And in fact, one even had a surveillance camera. So they have a photo of this guy, and they have it show him turning it away from him after he already walked up to the surveillance camera. So the police already know who this culprit is. And they found his Facebook page, and, uh, <laughs> and they know exactly where he lives. Yet all of that didn't deter the criminal's mind from doing the evil things that he did. Now, all these folks, including my son, could worry as much as they wanted to about someone breaking their home prior to it happening. But my point is, that wouldn't make any difference. You know, some of them had ADT systems. My son's got an ADT site right in front of his house. Was, we're controlled by, by this. If you break in here, an alarm system's going to go off. Other people have surveillance cameras. It still happened. It still happened. And so worrying about those things and about that misfortune still doesn't protect you from it. Then later in the week, my granddaughter, who attends the University of Illinois, but also takes a couple of classes because she's looking at veterinary science at Hartwood College, was evacuated because of a bomb threat. Again, there were campus police. There were cameras everywhere. Uh, to try to detect what was going on. But nonetheless, they still had to evacuate the campus. I actually called my granddaughter. You have to know Hannah because she just doesn't get excited about anything. And I said, uh, I said, Hannah, but I, I just heard on the news that, you know, are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. I said, what, what's going on? She said, well, somebody had a bomb threat, so they sent us all home. I said, what are you doing? I'm with a friend at the mall. I said, did you call your dad or mom? Yeah, I called dad. That's, you know, that's about the way she answered. I'm like, really? Really, uh, But all the worrying and all that preparation still doesn't deter people from doing those things. To bring our thoughts back into perspective with today's scripture, we hear Jesus speaking to these listeners and looking around him. As he looks at the ground, he sees little flowers and hears the birds. The birds can't sow. They can't really reap, but yet God provides them. They still have to work for their food, okay? You know, versus somebody doesn't just fall the food into their mouth. They still got to pick it up someplace. But it's there. If they seek it, they will find it. The flowers, the field, the lilies, not those little lilies in the valleys we think of, but those wildflowers probably were growing there are radiant and stunning. The truth is, we worry about a lot of things, but most of the things that we worry about, we can't control. We can worry about them all we want. We can make ourselves sick, and I know people who have made themselves sick from it. And probably, no doubt there's been a few times in my life that I've made myself sick worrying about things. But the reality of it is, there's nothing we can do. Worrying does not solve anything. We can worry about our food and our clothing. We can worry about our houses. We can worry about how we fit into society. But in all those things, what Jesus suggests is 
you are forgetting God's role in your life if you're allowing worry to overwhelm you. Getting right is what is important in our life. After all, John the Baptist and Jesus began their preaching ministries by saying, repent, right? Repent means to develop a new way of thinking. We kind of always think about repent. Oh, I did this, you know. I took my sister's doll and tore his head off or something. But really it means to develop a new way of thinking. To turn away from that old way of thinking. And as Jesus says at the end of this piece of scripture is, devote yourself to the kingdom of God. To thinking about the kingdom of God the way the kingdom of God should look like here on this earth. Striving for the kingdom of God. A kingdom not of power, not of might, but a kingdom of mercy, of justice, and grace. It's a kingness, kingdom of forgiveness, a kingdom of love, where prejudice is unheard of, and pride and conceit just plain don't exist. It's a kingdom where greed is absent. Now, we spend time in our life preparing ourselves for the future, for tomorrow, but sometimes we do that without really living in the present. Now, we're thinking so much about tomorrow that we don't really get to live right now. And yet, how we live right now is going to determine what happens tomorrow. How we profit from our mistakes and how, how we learn. So to illustrate that, I ran across a little book called The Present. It was written by Dr. Spencer Johnson. It's a story of a little boy and an old man who's kind of in a mentoring relationship. See, the little boy is riding his bicycle one day, the old man sitting on the front porch swing and seems very content with life and that kind of gets the little boy's attention. So the little boy sees the old man, turns his bike around and, and goes up to the little old man who's sitting there on the porch swing smiling and says, Old man, why are you happy? And the old man smiles and says, Because I have a present. And the little boy goes, wow, I love presents. I love Christmas presents and birthday presents, all kind of presents. How, how do I get a present? And the old man says, well, you really already have one. I already have one, the little boy says. I don't have any presents. And the old man says, yes, you do. You already have one. As you better understand that present, everything else will fall into place. So the little boy grows to be a teenager <coughs> The teenager, the old man, the little boy become friends. And the old man goes to watch him play baseball and watch him play football and do other things. And finally, one day as a teenager, the, he comes to the old man and says, Old man, what about that present you're talking about? The present, the old man said, is the greatest gift you could ever have. And the teenager said, I want that present. I want you to give me that present. He said, Well, I can't give you that present. You have the present already all by yourself. And once you realize it, everything else will fall into place. It's not a magic wand. It's not something I can wave over your head. It's something special. The young man becomes a, an adult, becomes a working man, graduates from college, and eventually goes back to the old man. He said, you know, I think I finally got it. The present talking about is right now. It's not a gift or anything else. And the old man says, yes, you're right. It's right now. It's enjoying the moment right now. It's being real right now. It's all being authentic. It's being in the presence. Well, he said, well, I can go back to my job now because things really aren't working out well. And so he returns to work and comes back to the old man a few days later. A few years later, he says, you know, I've kind of reached a plateau in my life. Nothing's happening. And I'm doing the present. I'm living in the present. And the old man says, yes, but you've forgotten to profit from your mistakes that you've had in the past. Only when you profit from your mistakes you've done in the past can you live in the present at its best. So the man goes back and practices and he remembers all his mistakes and after a few years, he's married, has children, he comes back and he says to the old man, I can't even get a promotion. I'm doing great work. They recognize it, but I can't get a promotion. The old man said, well, if you're doing everything right, you have a present. Enjoy the present. Huh? You've been profiting from your stakes. You don't have a plan for the future, though. You need a purpose. Huh? Write it down. Think about it. Work every day to make your plans come true. <clears throat> so the man went back to work and 
All of a sudden, his whole future changed because he had a purpose and a meaning. And as would happen, the old man died. And by then, this other fellow was in his middle age, and he turned to the funeral. And there they were, from the wealthiest to the poorest, everyone was in attendance. The old man had made friends with so many people along the way. He shared his successes in life with so many people and, and how boys and girls and children and, and men and women and old people and even the mayor of the town that came. And after the funeral, the man went back to the old man's house and he went up on the porch and he sat on the porch swing and began to swing back and forth and he thought, wow, you know, this old man's life had so much purpose had so much meaning. Down the street, the neighbor put a change, but there was still a lot of life there. A new family had moved in. They had a six-year-old girl. And she was on her tricycle. And she was riding by. And she rode by. She looked up at the man sitting on the porch swing. And she said, Wow, old man. And he turned and said, Yes. He said, You look so happy. Why are you so happy? He said, It's because... I have the present. Wow, she said, I love presents. I love Christmas presents, birthday presents, all kinds of presents. Can you help me get the present? The truth of the matter is that for all of us, the present is well-lived, profiting from our mistakes of our past and with a purposeful, purposeful future that we're striving for the kingdom of God. God knows our needs before we ever ask. God hears our wants before we ever want them. When our wants are shaped by God's will, then we can begin to think about God's future kingdom. How much time do we spend worrying about things that never happen? You ever worried about things that never even happen? How much time do you think spend worrying about things that you have no control over? I mean, the world we live, there are a lot of things we don't have any control over, but yet we worry about it. I go into coffee shops, I hear people almost into fits worrying about things that they have no control over. I mean, we live in a world where children are abused and deserted. Does it really matter what brand of clothes they're wearing? We live in a world where people don't know their next door neighbor, the people down the street. Is it really that important what kind of a vehicle you pull into your driveway? In a world where hurt is and not being accepted by one's peer group poisons children's self-image. Does it really matter if you're exhibiting the newest trends in our society? In a world where other people influence our children more than we do, should we be working to strengthen our children and our families for the kingdom of God and the way that God wants us to live? Maybe it's time for us to take more notice of not walk outside our door, but what's inside our house and try to imitate the way that God wants us to live and not try to imitate the way the world wants us to live. After all, Jesus reminded us at the end of the scripture, strive first for the kingdom of God and all these things will be given to you. Hear that again. Strive first for the kingdom of God and all things will be given to you. When we fall short of that, it's time for us to worry. And it causes us to worry because we think we are in control. But God is in control. <laughs> Not to worry then about tomorrow, for tomorrow will always bring worries of its own. Today's struggle is enough for you to handle. Today, well lived is what God wants you to do. This is the word of God for the people of God.